All right, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry we're a little bit late getting started. Uh, we know there's uh, been a couple of bad accidents around, so we're just waiting for some folks who might be caught on Highway 93 and some of that. Um, first, I want to start by a big thank you to Grounded Coffee from Midland for providing the coffee today. So make sure you drink that up. And I, I notice it's so, it's, 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 everybody's so excited, it's all over the floor back there. So be really careful with uh, the on-off tap on the coffee. Um, also a big thank you to our member municipality, Tiny Township, for uh, the building today and the great staff who came and helped us out this morning. Well, I'm being told I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do like that. Um, so thank you very much for the generosity of, of the hall. And I want to introduce our board chair, Stefan Walma, deputy mayor from Tiny, to uh, say a few words. Hello everybody and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today and taking the uh, time out of uh, what was a beautiful sunny day. Now it looks like we got to get some rain. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the SSEA is a uh, non-government organization dedicated to the Southern Sound environmental uh, quality since the late 1980s. The SSEA partnership established in 1997 is the vision of our nine member municipalities their dedication to our environment. So that's a big pat on the back to everyone in this room right now. Uh, huge thank you there. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize our board. So if I could get uh, each of you to stand up, and I'll just, I guess I can name the ones off the hip. Councilor Rob Kustra. I'm looking, I'm looking. Councilor Perry Ritchie. It's Danny. Councilor Barb Katanj. Councilor Pat File. Councilor Mike Louder. He was moving, I couldn't see him. <laughs> and I don't see anyone else. Councilor Ron Stevens at the back. And Deputy Mayor and also the Vice Chair of our uh, board, uh, Dave Richard. So thank you very much for being here today, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, we also have uh, other elected officials in the room. I don't have a list. Uh, so if I get all of you to stand up quickly, please. Thank you. Uh, your support. Uh, is, is extremely valuable and we appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our staff. If you look around the room, the boards that we have up on display, they, they didn't make themselves, they look beautiful. Uh, there's a very talented expertise in front of each of them explaining all of those. So if we look around the room to the people in the light blue shirts, I'd actually like to give everyone to give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, welcome to Tiny Township. We know we, uh, we have refreshments here today, and I'll hand the mic back over to our chair, or sorry, not our chair, our general manager, Julie Kim.
you talk very loud, so I don't need the microphone. Is that okay? Yep. I do need this. Okay. So it's really, in a, in a, I know this is the reality of the environment, changing environments, and that is my title side is I can't, the realities of the changing climate change. Because climate change is the big driving variable that is changing the environment for every, everybody and everything. And so we're, uh, uh, I'm going to start off uh, uh, before I go to that, just, uh, just a little bit of a, a story. And that is uh, because we're talking about adapting to climate change. It's not, I'm not going to talk a little very briefly about the nature of climate change or, or what uh, is, is that sort of how do we uh, mitigate climate change, as they say, or how do we reduce it. We're not going to go into that today. We're talking about the realities of how it is here, it is happening, and, and what does that mean for us, the people, who live on the land? But we've, we've learned a lot about climate change and how it's, how it's changing things very recently. Now, I was starting with a story like this. I did school of urology at university and stuff, and that was a long, long time ago. Uh, and, but I, you know, I was always pretty good at, at judging the weather pants. When I wanted to to mention my canoe trips, I go on the canoe trips, and the team I did back in, you know, the band I used to go with in the 80s, they had to talk about oh, it's really good in the weather. You can predict the weather the next couple of days, and I could, you know, with a fair degree of success. If, but if you know a little bit how the weather systems work, then you used to be able to say, you know, well, today is this, the clouds coming like this, well, that's going to be a front come through, and probably going to be clear and intense going to be dry when we go on the day after tomorrow, sort of thing, right? And you got a real sense of the pattern of the weather, and, and uh, that worked well for you years. Can't do that anymore. Now, could be because I'm old. <laughs> but I think uh, that there's another fact, because last year, Went to uh, a, a big community trip, two weeks in the wilderness, gang of us. I was going with uh, the, the, the guy, this Hat Wilson, who's a famous canoeist, you know, and, and he said, and I'd gone with him before, and he said, we were starting off on this route that we originally weren't going to plan. And he says, well, the good thing is that we'll be going east, due east, for about four or five days. He says, and, that, and you're never going to be spinning for more longer than a, you know, a day or so, so we're not going to get wind problems. We went due east. For five days straight and go ahead and east wind. So you never blow it well enough. Okay? Now you never get five days of east wind. You do now, right? And everything that I used to know about how predicting the weather is no good anymore. Because everything has changed. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Because everything has changed. So first of all, let's start off with general. This is just a, a slide on climate change. Uh, it relates, it's, they always show these kind of, they always talk about uh, a, a, a temperature anomalies. You know, like climate change is about the planet holding more heat and getting warmer. That's the general <laughs> theme of things. And the, the anomaly means how warm is it compared to some reference, usually a 30 year period reference. Really, this one is uh, back from 50 to 1980 or something, is the reference. You add them back, you say, well, how much warmer? Well, you find out that 2016 last year, this is every month of the year, they average all, uh, you know, for 30 years of January. Uh, and then you look at January 2016, well, it was 1.5 degrees warmer. And February and so much. And you can see the, warm, the warmest year in record in this planet is 2016, which beats the second warmest year, which is 2015, which beats the third warmest year, which is 2014. Now, that's the reality. It is, the planet is heating, we are, the climate is interacting that. Uh, by the way, if you're curious, we're about halfway through. 2017, it's going to score number two. It's going to hit uh, coming between uh, 2015 and 2016. So, 2016, keep the, keep the titles where for the time being. But the world is getting warmer. Okay, well, what we knew 20 years ago, what does that mean? So, that we, we, understand, we understand the physics of climate change. The world gets warmer. Well, one thing that happens is warmer air holds more water vapor. You get warmer, more, more humidity. And we know that if there's if the warmer atmosphere means changes, means, uh, well, first of all, it means changes in the growing season. And you've seen that with the farmers in the room, you've seen the, great, the growing season change. More drought and more extreme heat days. And you know that, generally speaking, for warmer conditions. But it also means there's more water in the atmosphere. More water in the atmosphere means, nice thing about, so actually, water is actually the primary greenhouse gas. The nice thing about that is that you can't get too much water because things get cool eventually, and then rains. But if you have more water in the atmosphere, you're going to have more heavy rainfall when it falls. That's, well, that's what we knew 20 years ago. We know that's, that's how physics works. We know a lot more today about what really is happening. And that's what I'm going to give you a bit of science here, then we'll get into the practical stuff. Okay? But I think it's important. You're not going to hear this anywhere else. 
Uh, this is, this is the, the, the latest stuff. So what do we now understand about the changes in the northern hemisphere weather as a result of this change in the heating of the climate? We do. And then the story starts with the Arctic sea ice. You've probably heard a lot of reference to the Arctic sea ice and, and the fact that there's a lot less ice in the Arctic than there was. I'm sorry, how much less? Well, the numbers don't really matter. It's in square kilometers here. The, the, uh, uh, the, the broad gray line is the, is the Arctic ice over a 30 year period. The average back in the day, 81 to 2010. Uh, the dotted line is what happened in 2012, which is previously the where the most ice melt melted through the melt season, where there was the least residual ice. The blue line is what's happening in 2017. It was the lowest year for Arctic ice uh, until recently, and now we're sort of tying with uh, the 2012. But there is less ice in the Arctic. Why does that matter? Well, that's the whole crux of what's happening there. And it's come from this. Ice at the top of the world is nice and white and reflects sunlight. If the ice melts, you get dark water, and dark water absorbs the sunlight, it absorbs the heat. And that's in fact, that's what they're trying to show here. This nice little cool dance <laughs> So, when the Arctic ice is out to its full extent, much of the sunlight that comes to the planet is reflected back off into space. As it gradually melts, the sunlight comes in and is absorbed by the water. It's a feedback system, of course, because the more it's absorbed by the water, the warmer the water, the less ice, the more the ice melts, right? But you're getting less <coughs> ice in the Arctic. The Arctic is actually getting warmer, substantially warmer. There are big problems up there with the, with the fact of lack of ice and melting of permafrost and all sorts of things. But the, the key thing for us is the Arctic is getting warmer than it was. And the whole weather systems of the world are hinge on the difference in temperature between the heat in the tropics and the cold in the Arctic. And so you, as we have, you know, the sun shines directly on the tropics, it gets very hot and obliquely or bouncing off the ice in the, in the, in the Arctic so that the, it's cold and the heat is trying to average itself out and the, the systems start moving. I want to come back to the later point, but that, that, that's the driver of the energy systems of the weather. The difference between the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics. What we're saying is, the Arctic's warming up. The energy system is depleted. There's not as much driving force in the energy. And one of the things that, that is a phenomenon, this is the only thing you have to understand, this, this little schematic is something called, when I, was, I remember years ago, I was on a flight from Vancouver to Toronto, and I'm back to Toronto, and the pilot comes on, he says, he says, uh, good news, we're going to be landing in Toronto 25 minutes early, because we got the jet stream, right? The jet stream is just very high up, 37,000 feet, this stream of air that north blows west to the east. And typically, it would look like this for most of our lives. It was like this. There was these, these little, there are these waves in them, but it's mostly here, it's like it's North America. So, jet stream, when you get a plane coming to Toronto, you get up in that fast air, it's going, you know, hundreds of kilometers an hour, boost the speed of the aircraft, you get into Toronto sooner. But that jet stream is, is, is caused, is in everything between, there was in the cold air out here, here, and the warm air from the south. And that's, that's the interface between the warm and the cold air, and you get this phenomenon called the jet stream. Well now, this is getting warmer. This is it's always saying, well, the difference of temperature is less, and it's affecting this jet stream. It means there's less energy. The jet stream has been slowing down, substantially slowing down. And one of the, one of the things when it slows down is they get these waves. Get like that. We're not going from Vancouver to Toronto anymore on the jet stream, unless you want to go through the old Nick and then down through Chicago. <laughs> right? Because you're getting these great huge waves in the jet stream because the system of the Earth heat system breaking down. If you're in this part of one of these waves, that's hot air from the south. And if you're in this part of one of these waves, that's cold air. The other thing that's happening is these loops that when I was a canoe guy, they, they're driving the weather systems. And every three or four days, the weather systems would change. When back in the 80s, that's what you could do. You know, high pressure area moving in. Oh, it's going to cloud area comes to low pressure, that kind of stuff. In three or four days, the weather pattern changes. No more. These things slow down and stay in place. And in fact, they're doing that right now. 
Okay, so what's happening?